Master, give the blessing. Wisdom. What you are about to listen to is a podcast produced by Philoclea Ministries. Philoclea Ministries is offered to all free of charge. However, there are real and immediate needs associated with it. If you are a regular listener or enjoy any of the content produced by Philoclea Ministries, we humbly ask that you consider becoming a contributor. You can learn more about our funding needs at www.philocleaministries.org. Please note that Philoclea Ministries is not a 401c3 nonprofit organization and that contributions are not tax deductible. Supporting Philoclea Ministries is just like supporting your other favorite podcasters and content creators, and all proceeds pay the production bills, make it possible for us to pay our content manager, and provide a living stipend for Father David. God bless you, and enjoy the podcast. Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome back, everybody, to our study of the Ladder of Divine Ascent by St. John Climacus. And we are picking up again with step number 27 this week. And we are currently on page 226 with paragraph 32 at the very beginning of the page. St. John says, why did the Holy Fathers of Tabanisi never have so many lights as those of the Skeet? Those of you who can understand this, I cannot speak, or rather, I do not wish to. So, in a way, John is saying that there was a richness, a strength, a beauty to the community in Skeet, precisely because they had those who were living in deep solitude. They had Hesychist, and their presence uh, among the community, although perhaps removed, living in a, sca- in a cave somewhere deep in the desert, it's nonetheless strengthened the community as a whole. So to have those so fully given over to the solitude, living in this constancy of prayer, elevates the entire community, strengthens the whole community. Whereas the, the community that is mentioned here is uh, one of Pacomius's. So it was a Cenobitic community, and the focus was certainly uh, beautiful there as well, but more on obedience and uh, the common life, and uh, so not t- typically having those who are dedicated to the Hezekiah's life. And uh, it says something important for us in terms of the need for those who enter into this deep solitude for the life of the church. They might be few and far between, uh, but nonetheless, their presence uh, becomes for us, uh, I think, a model. Uh, again, of the angelic life, but also their very presence, the action of God's grace within them, through them, strengthens the church as a whole, and certainly their own communities. And if we step back and think about this in terms of our communities, or maybe in a more uh, narrow way, uh, thinking just even of family life, that families that have those who are prayers who are deeply immersed in prayer can elevate the entire family, strengthen the family uh, through their their more radical openness to the the grace of God. It can bring healing, strength to the the family as a whole, and um, and so I think this is something you know a charism certainly that the church wants to foster, and uh, from what I've seen and encountered there there hasn't been uh sort of a a great um uh admiration of the monastic life is is not as much as i would have imagined uh that that at least that hasn't been my experience other than in certain areas uh and so uh the the advent of new communities, I think, is needed in order to strengthen the church as a whole. And I think I've mentioned this before, that there was uh, a Western bishop who said, you can sort of judge the strength of a diocese by the number of contemplative communities. 
that it has, that they really become an anchor for the diocese as a whole, a source of strength. And similarly, a monastery is that for the church as a whole, that connection to the spiritual tradition, the, the depth of it, a place where people can come for nourishment and to be guided in the ways of the faith. And so, you know, bishops, but all of us as Christians as a whole should be supporting vocations uh, to the monastic life, uh, knowing how important it is for the life of the church. Number 33, some diminish the passions, others sing psalms and spend most of their time in prayer, while some apply themselves to divine vision and spend their life in this profound vision. Let the question be investigated after the manner of the latter. He who is able to receive this, let him receive it in the Lord. So just as there is a ladder, as John puts forward before us in our growth and struggle in the spiritual life uh, and in virtue, uh, so there is for the hesychist in terms of the deepening of that life and moving into it more and more fully. The uh, attacks against it or the temptations against the life might become more subtle, but in some ways more fierce. And so a hesychist has to go uh, along a similar path and learn to deal with the things that come upon them that are most difficult for the, the one living in solitude. Uh, a, number would be, a number of these things would be despondency uh, or anger that uh, can arise in this solitude. And whenever uh, these passions exist and really have a hold on a person, living that life can be rather a, a, a rather dangerous affair, uh, especially since they are living on their own. He goes on to say, there are indolent souls living in monasteries and by indulging in what nourishes their indolence, they come to complete ruin. But there are also souls who, through living with others, strip themselves of their indolence. And the same thing often occurs not only with the careless, but with the zealous too. So, you know, John jumps back to say that the life of community uh, has a way of pulling us out of our laziness and negligence being surrounded by those who are pursuing the same path, breathing the same air as it were, desiring the same ends, uh, can aid us when we begin to slip in our zeal uh, for the Lord and in our urgency in the sense of our love for him and love for virtue. And, uh, and this even happens, John says, for those who are zealous in the spiritual life, that uh, being weakened or fatigued they can fall into periods where they ease up on their discipline. So to have others around them uh, is always something that is a source of strength. And I think the reason that John is coming back to this is to make it clear to us that one must not uh, prematurely enter into the life of deep solitude without having purified the heart. And in fact, the life would be impossible uh, to live if, if one was still weighed down and burdened, certainly by negligence or laziness, but uh, most certainly by uh, the, the, the you know, more difficult passions to overcome. We can apply this same rule to stillness. Stillness has received many experienced men, but has rejected them by reason of their self-rule and shown them to be lovers of pleasure. Others she has taken, and by fear and the concern for the burden of their condemnation has made them zealous and fervent. So in the life of the, the hesychist, uh, the, the life itself can spew them out, as it were, if they, they grow lukewarm uh, in their practice. And one of the reasons for this is that they live an idiorhythmic life. They follow a role that is basically set by themselves and uh, that they must interiorize. 
And there is, again, a kind of danger with that because they have to have interiorized the obedience uh, that they were taught and humility within the common life in order to sustain that. And if they are lovers of pleasure, again, they can lose that zealousness and so fall away from their, even their high vocation. Self-rule is always a dangerous thing in the spiritual life, uh, whether one lives in the world or in a monastery when we are guided by our own, our own uh, desires, you know, even when it comes to the spiritual life our own practices and devices rather than uh, where we are directed by another. Number 36. He who is still troubled by bad temper and conceit, by hypocrisy and remembrance of wrongs, should never dare to set foot on the way of stillness, lest he become deranged and nothing else. But if anyone is clear of these, he will know what is best, and yet I think, for not perhaps not even he. So, you know, even when our conscience does not bother us, as Paul reminds us, uh, that we cannot presume our innocence and purity of heart. That uh, while John tells us that you know when a person enters into this life, they can avoid these pitfalls, you know, bad temper, conceit, hypocrisy the remembrance of people's wrongs. Uh, but he says that he, he, even perhaps of these who are most prepared uh, do not see all, you know, all that there is about what goes on within and the vestiges of passions that have not been addressed in, in the spiritual life. And so they might experience great hardship and have to be prepared to experience a kind of affliction uh, within the life of, of solitude that is unique to that life in, in order that they might be purified and strengthened along that path. But strong words, John gives us here, that they will become deranged and nothing else, that there is a, a loss of a, a sense of reality that one can experience, that one can be called, drawn into you know, pray less, the fathers call it, you know, this kind of delusion about themselves and even cause themselves great harm and thinking that they're specially called by God or that they're being, they've been given special gifts. And, uh, and so they end up harming themselves physically and even to the point of death. Uh, the stories of the fathers is replete with, uh, you know, these uh, kind of, uh, warnings of from the lives of, of certain fathers who w walk off of a cliff with the same idea that the angels will come to protect them lest they dash their foot against the stone and so the delusion can be great art writes where can a lay person obtain a basic rule to follow to grow with and pro uh, pro progress in uh, certainly in talking with one spiritual director, I think it can be uh, altered to fit one's life. But there, if, there are a number of little works. The Malkites put out a book called, uh, what's the, the Publican's Prayer Book? And within it, uh, we are presented with certain prayers, a uh, prayer role. So the, the prayer role of Pacomius, in fact, is present within it as well. And not complicated and very simple. In fact, Pacomius felt that it was best uh, to have a role of life be simple and manageable and that uh, so that one is, is not simply pressing through a, a particular prayers and devotions. And uh, it's very straightforward. And so one could build on that, alter that with the aid, say, of one's confessor or spiritual director. Uh, and, you know, and taking into consideration one's, you know, particular vocation, the demands of their life, but beginning to create a role that allows uh, one to spend more and more time in prayer or to step away from the things that simply are distractions while yet attending to what is most imp important in their lives, marriage, family, and so forth. But that would be a good place to begin. 
uh, it's again, it's called the Publican's Prayer Book. And, uh, but it can, you know, Pocomis' role can be found online easily as well. Um, so very simple and straightforward. Okay, Adam Page put, put up uh, the link for the Publican's Prayer Book. Let's see, number 37. Here are the signs, courses, and proofs of those who are practicing stillness in the right way. An unruffled mind. I think most of us would probably stop with that first one, an unruffled mind, that you know, an individual who's not undone, even by the chaos around him, or the spiritual attacks that are coming that is able to remain in the peace of Christ, not thrown out of himself and uh, fragmented by anxiety uh, about what's going on in, in the world or around them. And, uh, and so those you know, living uh, you know, in this life of stillness or have obtained a certain level of it within the world you know, this would be a powerful sign that there seems to be a peace that uh, is within them, even in the face of great trials and affliction, that they take one moment of time clinging to Christ. And so don't give sign of being undone or distressed or anger, angry in the face of those things. And in general, I think this is a good sign for all of us in terms of our, our general progress in the spiritual life as well. The more that we trust in the grace of God, his love, uh, the deeper our faith becomes, the less that we are uh, ruffled, as it were, by the circumstances of our daily life. Purified thought. So the habit of mind is this movement towards Christ where one's life becomes a sacrifice of prayer, praise, the, where one becomes prayer, that the, the joy and the sweetness of one's life is to be immersed in prayer. And so there isn't uh, this temptation towards distraction or to be pulled away by thoughts that are of a passionate nature that would draw us then into sinful imaginations and the like. Rapture towards the Lord. So oftentimes th those who are immersed this deeply seem abstracted from the life around them, not aware of the things that really stand out for others as having a certain level of import or that creates again, a kind of fear or takes hold of the imagination that one is so wrapped in the, the beauty and the sweetness of the love of the Lord that that which is less than, 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 than it is does not take hold uh, of the mind or the imagination. And so at times they will seem sort of uh, disconnected from popular uh, you know, realities that often are so exciting to people. And it's interesting, uh, I typically don't watch television, except when I'm here at my, mom, <laughs> at my mom's, but uh, the commercials are uh, a funny thing to see, you know, that there is this kind of energy. And one came on today and it was about uh, uh, like the Olympics. And there was such an energy uh, in these 30 seconds of, of this commercial. I thought, goodness sake, the, the money, the attention, everything that went into uh, this that involves sports and the celebration of it as, uh, as having, you know, uh, uh, this capacity to take hold of people's imagination and excite them. Uh, I think what we find in those who are so deeply immersed in the spiritual life is the opposite of that, 
that they find themselves, as John says, raptured towards the Lord. That, that, that what takes hold of their mind, their heart, their imagination, every aspect of, of their being is the pursuit of the sweetness of being immersed fully within that relationship. And those other things that, you know, are often the focus of such great attention has no hold on them whatsoever. So they can be so out of touch, you know, in, in the sense of who, you know, the, the great musicians are of the day and what the popular music is. Recollection of eternal torments. So it's a curious thing, isn't it? That the purer that one's heart becomes, the more sensitive the conscience becomes as well. And there is no such thing as a minor sin or insignificant sin, that anything that becomes an impediment to giving oneself over fully to the will of God uh, is set off in sharp relief for an individual whose heart's been purified in this way, as well as then the thought of standing before the all holy God, you know, giving an account for one's life and how one has embraced this extraordinary gift of his grace. So the remembrance of death is constantly before one's mind and not even in the sense of fearing it and even a kind of desire for it, but the acknowledge, uh, acknowledgement of the fact that we, one does have to uh, give account for how, how we live our lives. The urgency of death, sort of an interesting phrase, you know, that again, an urgent longing uh, draws us to, to the desire to be with the Lord. And we hear ta Paul talk about this uh, to his communities that, you know, that there was this longing for him to be with the Lord and didn't know which was better, you know, to leave this world in order that that great desire would be fulfilled or to remain in order to be able to serve the Lord and serve those that have been placed in his, in his charge. But the, the greater longing was to set aside the things of this world, uh, to know, know the eternal embrace of God. Constant hunger for prayer. And so prayer is not something that one has to force oneself to do, that there becomes an insatiable hunger to be immersed in it because of the nourishment and the refreshment that it does bring. That, uh, you know, we talked about the little story that, you know, for the one who's sort of indolent, lazy or negligent, you know, the, they perk up and energy fills their hearts when they hear the, re the bell for the refractory ring. And uh, it's the opposite is true for the hesychist. You know, that, that brings a kind of sadness that, you know, the, the time of that deep prayer has come to an end. Or as we talked about, that the, the sun rises in the morning and uh, that time of deep prayer during vigils has come to an end. And there's all, often a kind of lament of that. Unsleeping vigilance. So uh, uh, a wakefulness, e even when they are at rest, and perhaps having disciplined this, the, themselves so, so much that they need very little sleep and are restored so deeply by their prayer and nourished by it, that their need for the nourishment of the things of the body even seems to diminish. And there's something certainly miraculous about this, but we hear this often about the saints and those who are deeply immersed in prayer and have grown in this and in, in, in virtue in such a deep way that we hear of some saints being nourished upon the Eucharist alone for a period of time or, you know, fasting for a long period of time. And uh, similarly, in an unsleeping vigilance that there's, no, you know, even when sleeping, the heart is awake. The heart has been so formed uh, as to be attentive to even the most subtle movements uh, to the point that when even when one dreams uh, that they find themselves 
if they are provoked in a dream by a thought that is of a sinful nature, they find themselves doing battle within the dream against the provocation, even though you know, they aren't conscious of it or willing it. Wasting away of lust. So, you know, the appetite that has such, such a powerful pull upon us as, as human beings. And in our day and age, you know, in a hypersexualized society and, you know, with the advent of pornography such as it is and the, the breakdown of sort of the moral norms of society in terms of how people dress and all of such things that the waste, the idea of the wasting away of lust, uh, that this pull would become non-existent for them, that they are drawn, love sort of overcomes love or lust, I guess in this case, that the, the pull of the desire, the, the greater desire for the Lord orders uh, what is disordered, the, the desire of the flesh. And so all the energy that surrounded that, it, it's almost like, um, what's the word for it? Sublimation, you know, that uh, it's typically in uh, psychological parlance, sublimation is one of, as a kind of defense mechanism. So not really conscious, conscious, but sometimes the baser desires will be redirected by the unconscious mind and this kind of ideal, E ego that we have or this uh, sense of right and wrong within us can be redirected towards more positive ends. And, uh, but for the spiritual, you know, that there has been an active formation of the mind and the heart and also that is touched by the grace of God, that there is a perfecting of that. And uh, on a very deep level, certainly on a conscious level, uh, where they aren't giving themselves over to such thoughts and not even having them come to mind, but even on the deepest level of the, their being, the unconscious, that there is a healing that's taken place, that the lust itself wastes away. There's no trace of it. Ignorance of attachment. So which is not the same as a lack of love for others in this world. In fact, there is a greater freedom and liberty uh, in Christ to, to love in the way that we've been created to love. And so there might even be something far more beautiful in that when we no longer objectify the others, where we no longer enter into relationships uh, in such a way uh, where we are seeking our own ends, uh, but seeking simply to love the other. And similarly, you know, our attachment to the material things of this world, that we are detached in such a way that we can appreciate the gifts of God that are provided for us for our need, but don't feel that pressure to go beyond, uh, to seek security in them. And so a kind of perfect uh, detachment here, death to the world. And so often, the, you know, the world, as the fathers use the word, has to do with the passions as a whole. Uh, if you die before you die is one of the phrases written, I think, by on Mount Mon Athos, I think, in one of the monasteries. If you die before you die, then you won't die when you die. And it's sort of a, a little bit of a tongue twister. Uh, but so death to the world, that the, the passions, that habitual sin or tendency towards sin that develops within us is, is dispersed to the point that we have died to the things of the world that have this uh, pull upon us that is disordered. But in that death, we, we rise to true freedom and life in Christ. So we can, you know, whether it's in abundance or in lack, we can live in a kind of peace. Loss of gluttony. So again, an appetite that is so tied to who we are 
that uh, that through, certainly through the practice of fasting, but again coming to see uh, that the the hunger that one experiences within oneself is so deeply satisfied by Christ and how He gives Himself to us in the Holy Eucharist, that He is the bread of life, and so this practice of fasting that really orders the appetite, uh, but it, added to that then our mystical participation uh, in the Holy Eucharist and in the Paschal mystery that we consume life, love, that then, you know, our tendency to move to food or gluttony in other arenas, our tendency to do that disappears completely uh, because we aren't moving to those things for consolation. Uh, which we often do, that we will seek consolation in food. We eat for comfort, and we even eat out of aggression. I don't know if you've ever seen yourself do, doing that, pull out a bag of chips, you've had a stressful day, and you're not even hungry, and you're just like gnawing one chip after another. And that's a kind, you're not even, it's not even eating to soothe, it's sort of an aggressive kind of eating as well. And but a, a person who is immersed in the grace of God so deeply and finds that nourishment in his love, then then th that gluttony disappears. Foundation of theology. So their very life becomes the foundation of theology that they are living this life that is orthodox. They are living in right glory, doxa. And so in every way, they have immersed themselves uh, in the life of grace and so been transformed that they become theology. Uh, I'll have to post an article about this. I can't remember. Uh, the the elder who wrote about it, but this is one of the goals of the spiritual life to become theology that our very being the way that we live our lives speaks of God and what has been revealed to us, not uh, so much in words, but in the way that uh, and the manner in which we live our life and engage others. So this life that has been so purified then becomes the very foundation of that reality that their silence speaks. And I think this takes us back to the first paragraph or the first or second paragraph where he talks about these uh, hesychists as br being a source of strength for their community. They become a foundation upon which the community is built and a source of nourishment in terms of this experiential knowledge of God and what a blessing that would be for a community to have its elders. This is a hard thing in our day because we typically, not that we don't have our elders, but elders aren't typically held in great respect. Uh, I think I mentioned to you sort of on a sad note once, uh, a friar, a Franciscan friar who, you know, had lived his life, uh, you know, as a Franciscan for so many years and was a holy soul and he had taught at one of the universities but eventually went back and was living with one of his communities and uh involved in formation and you know finding himself being argued with by you know one of the novice uh friars and at one point being led to ask him well doesn't you know my life the experience of my life hold any weight you know, in terms of the things that I'm saying. And the person basically said no to him. And it was sort of shocking, especially in the context of religious life. But uh, we have lost this sense, I think, of the blessing that elders are, or can be, or need to be for religious communities, but within families, you know, the breakdown of the families where we often don't have that extended family of grandparents, aunt and uncles who have this long experience that uh, that can uh, bring to us a kind of wisdom about life and the trials that we undergo. And similarly, I think in 
religious communities, uh, either they might be absent or even in a sense driven out sometimes of their communities because the vision uh, of, uh, of a community can alter so greatly over the course of time. If again, there's this kind of self role rather than humility and allowing one and docility and allowing oneself to be guided and taught about the, the realities of the common life, obedience and humility. You know, if we live in a culture where, you know, there is a kind of uh, a growth and prevalence of uh, narcissism, a focus upon self. Uh, and again, this kind of self role that John is, is talking about at times, that it becomes very difficult to have formation that is fruitful because there's such a level of work that needs to be done there. We can't count on the fact that individuals are going to be raised within a family with these kinds of sensibilities, uh, both in regards to how they engage elders, but also how they uh, think about the, the spiritual life or that they've been formed in the life of virtue at all or have an understanding of the faith. Uh, one priest I knew taught at seminary, and they had just this be beginner's course for, you know, guys coming into the seminary that was on the catechism of the faith, that they had to add this because, again, not assuming that there was this understanding of the faith. And then eventually they had to spread it out over the course of an entire year in order to make sure that there was just this basic understanding upon which to build. And so to have someone who is the foundation of theology, what an extraordinary gift that they would be to the church as a whole, but also to the larger, their larger community. A well of discernment. So a capacity to comprehend the things of God and the action of his providence to guide others uh, in the way of, of faith and through the darkness that they might be experiencing. But again, they have this experiential knowledge of God, and they become theology in such a way that they're able to see this truth and help others to comprehend it. A truce accompanied by tears. And so, you know, living in the body, experiencing uh, the needs that it has, uh, a truce is uh, come to through tears, through compunction, that uh, the body is humbled uh, through the ascetic life and the heart is cleansed through uh, the shedding of tears. But it's really only a truce. The moment that we let off uh, of the ascetical practices and where we lose that spirit of repentance and contrition, the truce is broken. It's all out war. And, but that truce is, you know, fragile, you know, that the appetites have to be guided and directed through the ascetic life, through the life of prayer. Uh, and so in the spiritual battle, again, there's no rest in that regard in order to maintain, again, this fra fragile kind of internal peace. Loss of talkativeness that, uh, you know, the limitation uh, of words and the meaning that they carry becomes more and more evident. And uh, you know, certainly the recognition that the distraction that idle chatter can be is there. But I think one uh, realizes that the things that we say about God fall so short from uh, 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 fall so short of the reality of God that uh, one does not move quickly to talk about things and the, the humility is so deep as well that one does not want to present oneself as an expert or an elder, a teacher, but always stay in, in the role of one who is being led or learning. And uh, no matter how old we are, that we would stand before others 
with this kind uh, of attitude. And again, you know, our culture teaches us to talk so freely about so many different things. You know, there can be a conceit of knowledge if you're well educated in one area, you know, often that will lead to a kind of pride that you assert your opinion about, you know, uh, theology if you you know you're an expert in you know engineering or something and uh and so th there can be uh this tendency and we see it online to how people talk about politics or about medicine all these things that everybody becomes the expert about the church or all of these realities and uh, what we see develop in the hesychist is this loss of talkativeness, you know, a realization that most often it leads to dissipation and that we can become a source of distraction for others and that the silence uh, in which we live and bear ourselves can speak more deeply than our words. If that silence is something that is filled with the love of God, where we are listening to the word that he speaks to us, then our very being again becomes something that communicates the, the fullness of the gospel to others. So it's the lived life, the experience that is most important. And many such things which the common run of men are wont to find quite alien to themselves. So, often you know we take so many things for granted about the way that we perceive the world perceive ourselves and reality our understanding of things whereas uh to enter into this relationship with god we, we see how limited that is and often how we uh our vision of reality is contrary to the the, the to the wisdom and knowledge of god as high as the heavens are the earth, so are the ways of God above man's ways and the knowledge of God above our knowledge that the deeper one enters into that truth, you know, the, the, uh, the more that we're going to see that our perception of all these things are off. And it can be quite the awakening uh, and unsettling when uh, all of a sudden our way of living our life is called into question when we have some encounter you know uh with another or or with reality with death uh that we are awakened to you know, the, the meaning of our lives in a way that we've we've never seen it before and such is the encounter with christ you know like the woman at the well this man man told me everything about my life he knew everything and told me everything about my life and we only hear a part of that conversation one wonders what it might have been even more fully but uh you know the excitement that it breeds within her to make her an evangelist to run back to her townspeople and enough that it moves them despite her identity among them it moves them to run out to to listen to Christ, and then they come to believe, not only because of her word, but because of this encounter that they have with he who is reality. And sometimes it can be incredibly uncomfortable, you know, the where uh, Jesus cast out demons or when he cast them into the swine and the swine run into the sea and are drowned. The townspeople beg Jesus to leave them. That you know they can be more comfortable with the demonic in their presence than with the living God, who has this power to to drive the demons out. It's almost like that the presence of that life, that power, becomes a threat to them. Father Marty writes, being with people who push my buttons seems to me to be one of God's most common ways of showing me what he wants to heal me. Metropolitan Vlachos, with his priest in mind, once wrote a book 
on the healing found in the Desert Fathers. He admitted that they had a good academic study of theology, but he lamented that they did not know how to lead their flocks into healing because they had not gone down the path of their own healing. His remarks in the book was, theology is the fruit of man's healing. Herotheus Vlachos is an extraordinary writer and uh, was really the first one for me as well that sort of opened up uh, a deeper understanding of, of, of the fathers in the sense of, of this understanding of healing and also of, of theology. So if you have an, an opportunity to read, he's, he's written a number of works, but Orthodox Psychotherapy is one of them. And so Orthodox, the healing of the soul that comes through living the spiritual life fully. And he's right. You know, how can one bring healing or be a source of healing and guidance to others if one is has not been healed himself or herself? So, yeah, but I'm right with you there, Father Marty. You know, this, uh, how did you start there? Having people push my buttons. And it cannot, you know, sometimes it's not even the pushing of buttons, but it's uh, something that uh, triggers something for us. So it's not even that they're purposely doing or saying something, but uh, I have a little self-revelation here. I've told a couple of uh, this story already, but Art had asked me about, I think it was Art, about Angela from Australia. Do you remember Angela? And so I wrote her and, you know, I said, you know, how have you been doing? You know, the group asked about you and we know that you were traveling, you had gone on pilgrimage. And, uh, and so we were wondering, you know, if you're thinking about coming to, back to the group at some point. And, you know, as often happens when you're on like Facebook or Messenger, if, if you hit an emoji, sometimes you could hit the wrong emoji. And all the response I got back at first was an angry face emoji to what I had written her. And immediately I was thrown out of myself. I began to wonder, oh my gosh, you know, was there something said within the groups that made her angry? Or was she not doing well and that I had taken so long and I'd gone back to look at my last communication with her and it had been over a year. And so my thoughts began to wonder, well, you know, it took you a year to write me this, you know, you, I, all these thoughts began to write, run through my mind. And for a whole day, it took hold of me. And uh, until she wrote back a message telling me all that was going on, that she was teaching RCIA, a Bible study, that she had hoped to incorporate the fathers into this. And, but her plan is she's making another trip to the UK and she's going to be gone for a couple of months, but her plan after that is to join us again and how much she misses the groups. So it was completely, it was, it was uh, moved by something that, you know, wasn't a, a slip of the finger, but the demonic provocation, we see like lightning, how swiftly that moves. You know, what did I fail to do? Is this person angry? You know, how could things switch so quickly? You know, when she was such a major part of the group and contributed now to have, you know, this anger directed towards me. And, uh, and you know, I've had similar experiences to that where that was the truth in a hard to understand. Uh, and, but it was enough then to become a moment of temptation to trigger something in me, whether it was vainglory, you know, of being overly worried about how somebody was re reacting to me, viewing me. But uh, so what, what Father Marty says here, uh, people pushing my buttons, that we might think that we are free of these things, that we aren't ruffled by them. And then something like this so small can happen where it's deeply humbling, where you see yourself undone, you know, pride rideth before the fall. All of a sudden you're on the ground uh, and you've been thrown by the horse because you, you know, felt that you were free uh, of, of these kinds of things. And this one is, wasn't even based in reality, which is even, even more humbling about it. 
Wren writes, that day I might have gotten a message from Father Charbel saying he was going to into permanent seclusion. Yes, that was one of my thoughts. It was like, I think I should just, I think I should go to, you know, to the monastery or I should stop doing podcasts that I should just, uh, you know, immerse myself in silence. Uh, and so it, it can show very quickly the, the state of our mind and how changeable you know, you'll love that first homily of Isaac the Syrian when he gets to it, because he talks about this aberration of mind, the inconstancy of our mind, the changeableness of our mind. And when it happens that swiftly, uh, it can be a truly unsettling thing. All, all of a sudden, a, a light shines upon something so brightly that <laughs> you're undone. Julie writes, St. Dyaticus taught, just as when the doors of the baths are left continually open, the heat inside is quickly driven out. So also the soul, when it wishes to say many things, even though everything that it says may be good, disperses its concentration through the door of the voice. I remember that quote, and that's beautiful, that if we are constantly open the furnace door, we are allowing the heat to escape. And so similarly, when we're opening our mouth and we are engaged in talkativeness and, and certainly talking about things that maybe are of a more intimate nature that we can dissipate, you know, our fervor for the Lord or certain gains in the spiritual life by doing so. And so becoming more discriminating in that regard as to when we open our mouth and what we, what we have to say. Okay, any other thoughts? So don't send me any angry emojis because you know how, <laughs> how sensitive I am. <laughs> you'll, you'll wreck me. Okay, number 38. And here are the signs of those who are practicing stillness in the wrong way dearth of spiritual wealth, so a lack of fruit in the spiritual life, that, you know, what one sees is perhaps an empty asceticism, uh, but uh, a silence that betrays a lack of joy, a lack of, of peace. That would be that seclusion that someone runs to when their feelings have been hurt, that there would be a dearth of spiritual fruit in that uh, increase of anger. So, you know, there's nothing, you know, in silence, uh, it becomes very difficult to blame others and to dissipate the anger that we might have. And, uh, and so we can find ourselves becoming angry at inanimate objects, or creating things in our mind, in our imagination to become angry, to magnify things in such a way uh, that we, our hearts are stirred to a greater anger or things from imagination and memory come forward to present themselves for us to become angry about them again. And so we find ourselves ruminating. So a person living in silence, you would think, oh, how blissful that will be. People often will post these images of cabins and say, would you, would you live here without internet and everything for a million dollars, you know, for a whole year? And everybody says, oh, ab absolutely, I would do that. And, you know, I think for the majority of people, after a week, they, they would go nuts in such an environment because they would stand exposed and find their mind running after all these things. Because we take ourselves wherever we go. And so if we take a passion-filled mind and heart into seclusion, then it can, it can lead to derangement. And the magnif magnification of the things that stir the passions, in particular, something like anger. Number 30, I'm um, sorry. A horde of resentment, which follows on increase of anger. So again, that rumination uh, on past wounds and memories 
uh, can re really then uh, lead to, to a growth of that resentment, uh, a hoard of, of it. Uh, but then we even begin to hoard it. You know, we hold on to that resentment uh, because it becomes something very real for us. Uh, you know, it sort of hurts so good to be angry at another and to feel justified in it. And so at times we aren't willing or able uh, to let go of those things. We will ho hold on to them. The di di diminution of love, so a weakening of love, a weakening of our capacity to, to give ourselves in love and to receive love, our hearts uh, become closed to it, growth of vanity. So again, you know, we aren't able to see ourselves as reflected in the eyes of the other and in the dynamic that we have with others that often will reveal our impatience, our lack of humility. And so when there, there's nothing in reality that checks that for us, then this explosion of vanity can take place. We begin to live in the illusion of our own mind of having reached the state of freedom or holiness. And he says, I will be silent about all the rest which follow. I think he doesn't want to depress us too much. But that's probably enough for one night. Listening both to the good things and the bad things are equally difficult right and uh hard for the mind to handle so so these are the signs and i thought they were particularly helpful in the spiritual life as a whole uh as a little examination of conscience these two paragraphs could take us a long way in preparing for confession and you know even just in our daily examination number 40 the signs of those who are lawfully, unadulterously, and sincerely wedded to this orderly and fair obedience, both in reality and according to the teaching of the inspired fathers, are these. And every day, if only we have cons consecrated the day to the Lord, they reach forward and obtain increase and progress so that they may become perfect in due time and increase in elementary humility a lessen, lessening of bad temper, for how can it not decrease as the gall is exhausted? Dissipation of darkness, accession of love, the growth of love, estrangement from the passions, deliverance from hatred, diminution of lust through continual rebuke, ignorance of despondency, increase of zeal. So ignorance of despondency that we know nothing but the joy of the Lord and living in the Lord. And the approach of the things that would call into question the value of our, of our life and our spiritual warfare and the depth of our prayer is uh, something that completely escapes the mind, that one is not attended, attentive to at all. Compassionate love, banishment of pride. This is the achievement which all should seek, but few attain. A well without water does not deserve the name. And what follows, he who is capable of thought already knows. So, the, and the little footnote helps here, uh, that if all of these things are lacking, uh, we are told that uh, we cannot be called obedient souls. Those who have this capacity to hear the word of God, uh, whose minds and hearts have been purified. And so if we see ourselves struggling with these things, we have to enter more fully in, into the life of conversion or repentance, of obedience, of fostering humility. And again, not seek to too swiftly or even at all might be the more sanctifying reality for us uh, to even at all to pursue the, the life of solitude. Ours might always to be, to be, be to live in community, even though at times we have 
you know, a kind of longing within our heart for that solitude, the will of God might be for us to live in certain circumstances that really do shape the mind and the heart and free us from these passions. And we should not lament that. You know, I think we, we see that as, have to see that as trusting in the providence of God, that he'll do everything and draw us along the path that is for our sanctification. So any thoughts, you know, we're close to 8.30 here, but any final thoughts or comments about what we looked at tonight? A lot, a lot to think about and contemplate. So everybody smile so that I can leave the group tonight <laughs> feeling encouraged and, uh, and we'll stop for the evening. Thank you so much. And why don't we close as always with the, our Father, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Lord be with you. And I want to God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. God bless everybody.